Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. When we were watching this as, uh, as a team and just kind of preparing for this message, one of the lines that really struck a chord in my heart was at the very beginning when this, this kid uh, named Louis says this. He says, let me be nothing. And, you know, that really spoke to me because I have had moments in my life where I feel or I have told God, just let me be nothing right now in this moment. Have you ever been in that very low place in life and you're just, like, not wanting to be there? You, It's almost surreal. Like, I've been in situations that have been so challenging, like, so big, bigger than me, where I have felt like, God, man, please get me out of this situation. Please, I don't want to be here right now. But how many know that with God, God doesn't think, let me be nothing? As a matter of fact, Jesus didn't die for nothing. Jesus died with a purpose. Jesus died with a mission. Jesus died to pay for your sins, my sins. Jesus died in order for you and I to have life and not just have any life, but have an abundant life. But I know that there are so many of us. I, if I were to ask, and if you were to be honest, and I were to say, have you ever felt like, let me be nothing? I'm sure most of us would say, yeah, I've ha- I, I'm actually feeling like that right now. Maybe there's someone that feels I honestly feel like nothing. Well, let me tell you something. God is bigger than your nothing. He's so much greater than any person's sin. He is so much greater than any setback. He's so much greater than any trouble, any challenge. He is so much greater than just nothing. God wants to do something special and unique in your life. So watching this clip, how does that apply to me? Great question. Well, let's look at what Jesus tells one of his disciples because all throughout Bible from Old Testament to New Testament, There is not one person that served God on the earth that wasn't challenged, troubled, that had setbacks, that were being chased by an enemy. Every single person that served God experienced some form of trouble. And it's interesting because so many of us sometimes, we think that just because I become a Christian, just because I become this Christ follower, everything should just work out amazingly fine for the rest of my life. And that is by far not the truth. It is not the truth. We will all experience some sort of pain in this life. But like he said in the movie, if you can take it, you can make it. Say that with me. If you can take it, you can make it. Let's look at Luke chapter 22, verse 31 and 32. Let's look at what Jesus said. He says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you disciples like wheat. Now think about this. This is Jesus warning Peter. This was Simon. But his real name was Peter. So he says, Peter, Satan has asked to sift. Mind you, he says he asked. Satan can't just waltz in your life and just cause havoc, honestly. In this moment, in this context, Satan is actually looking at Jesus and saying, hey, do you mind if I can sift your servant Peter for a little bit? And I love the fact that Jesus allowed him and sometimes you go through stuff and you're like I can't believe I'm in this situation how many know that sometimes God will allow certain things like Satan will tempt you while God will test you I know you don't like hearing that on a Sunday morning huh let's look at the word sift look this is what the word sift means it means to poke around in assess go through turn over have you ever felt turned over (laughs) explore examine inspect or scrutinize think about this satan has asked to explore investigate to scrutinize he has asked to go through he has asked to examine to see where you're really at because he so many times just because you have the title christian doesn't necessarily mean that you're honestly truthful truthfully and genuinely you're following christ in faith And so Satan is now, he's saying, okay, let's check out your servant, Peter. Let's see if he is the real deal. And so he starts assessing him. He starts scrutinizing his faith. He starts, you know, exploring it. He starts turning over his life. And we know that this message that Jesus was telling Peter, it wasn't the present moment. Everything was good. Like some of you right now, you're sitting here and things are just going wonderful. Well, Jesus wasn't talking present tense. Jesus was preparing him for what was about to take place in his life. So watch this. So he says, verse 32, but don't trip, Peter. Don't get anxious. I have prayed for you, Simon. I have prayed that your what? 
Are you, you guys are quiet for a 10 o'clock service, like really quiet. Okay, let's try this again. I have prayed that your what? Faith will not what? Fail. He says, when you have turned back, help your brothers to be strong. When you have turned back, now mind you, Peter hadn't left Jesus just yet. Jesus already knew that Peter was going to abandon him. Jesus already knew that Peter was going to literally say, I never knew that man. Jesus already knew that Peter was going to have a moment in his life of pressure. He knew that Satan was going to come and instill fear on him, was going to come and try to literally distract him from his, from his purpose on the earth. And we know that Peter, later on in the story, he ran away once, Peter was, once Jesus was arrested. And now he's going back to his old you know, job. He's defaulting back to his old ways. And so Jesus was telling him, hey, listen, don't trip, Peter, because I have prayed for you. In the midst of your situation, I have prayed that your faith will not fail you. And aren't you glad that there's someone? Listen, you may say, I have no one to pray for me. Well, guess what? Jesus is praying for you, and he's calling you by name. If he did it for them, he'll do it for you. And so the thing that is fighting you right now, and this is what I want you to know. The thing that is fighting you right now is honestly fighting him. And when you have that perspective, because that's what Jesus was telling Peter, hey, listen, the, the enemy that's coming to fight you is really fighting me, but don't sweat it because I have already given the devil a beatdown, or I'm about to give him one. And how many know that having your own skill set, having your own ability is not enough to win a battle with Satan? How many honestly know that? Because I think sometimes you got Christians that are like, yeah, I'm going to put the whoop down on the you, you can't put the whoop on the whip on the devil. You can't do that. Jesus destroyed every single work of the devil. In other words, Jesus is the only one who can literally take down any of the works that the enemy is trying to bring on you or who will try to bring something on you. It's Jesus. So it's not your skill set alone that's enough to do this. It's not your ability that's going to give you the strength to do this. It's putting your faith back in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And so why would Satan ask for Peter? Let me tell you why. Because Satan already knew that Peter would be the leader of all the other disciples. And it's amazing. When God puts a special thing on you, and every single one of you, you're special in, in, in your own special way, the way God created you. Let me tell you something. The enemy already knows that there's a future with hope. He may not know all the details of your future. God knows all that. But the enemy will literally, it's almost like, like when you get saved, it's, it's like all hell breaks loose. Like you think life was good. Before you came to Christ, and then you come to Jesus, and you're like, man, everything's falling apart. No, it's just that you were blind before, but now you see, right? And, and it's like this big red X on my back. I have felt in the years of walking with Christ, like, I feel like, man, there's this X, and the enemy just tries to come and drop his bombs on my life, you know, throughout the years of 22 years of walking with him. But I know for a fact the only reason that we all experience these type, these type of attacks is because he comes to sift. He comes to, now if Satan takes the time to examine your faith, shouldn't we put a little bit more effort to examine our own faith? To check ourselves before we wreck ourselves? Wouldn't it be a little bit smart to really begin to investigate and to really check if we honestly, truthfully trust God in every area of our life or if we're failing somewhere? See, when your faith is not strong, then the enemy comes in and gets a foothold, then the stronghold, and then we start falling apart. That's what happened with Peter. His faith was struggling, but thank God that Jesus prepared him. He said, but don't worry, Peter. I have been praying that your faith won't fail you. But here's the deal. And when you come back and when you return, see, there may be some of you that you've walked away from God. You've been doing life the way you want to do it. At one point, you were strong with God. At one point, you did have that strong kind of faith with God. But along the way, life has happened, and now you've kind of drifted away. But God's saying, hey, listen, but don't worry. I'm going to use every single attack. I'm going to use every single setback. I'm going to use every single hurt, every pain, and I'm going to use it for something stronger and better. Because here's the reality. Any storm that you're in in this life, it's, it's never meant or it's never about you. It's, it's about what God's going to do through you and how it's going to bless someone else. You look at this guy, Louis, 
oh my God, not only is the guy, you know, you think he has a high, right? He's this kid and he hears these words from his brother, if you can take it, you can make it. And he's like, okay, so he uses that to go and, and mix it all the way to the Olympics, right? He's on a high, yay, now he's at war. Then his plane is shot down. Now he's at sea, 47 days. Then there's sharks right there coming around. They have no food. They're, they're literally trying to eat a bird. Uh, Scott, the guy who was friends with them, he said, he told them the story about when they caught a pelican because they had no food. They, they killed the pelican. They opened the pelican. It was filled with maggots. And, and they're like, you know what? He's like, we're not going to do this. So they used it to catch fish. So they were eating seafood and, you know, uh, sushi, you know, for, for all of But think, just think, 47 days. And then you think that they're finally rescued, and it's the Japanese. They're in World War II. It's crazy. Now he is a prisoner of war, and he's going through all that hell. But do you remember in the story, and, and I confirmed it with Scott, and he did. He prayed to God. He said, God, if you, if you get me out of this situation, I'll do anything for you. I'll do whatever you want. You know, sometimes it just takes that simple prayer to say, you know, God, man, if you just get me out of this situation right now, I'm going to commit my life to whatever it is that you want. Wherever you tell me to go, I'll go. Whatever you tell me to do, I'll do. I am willing to commit my life to you. And listen, be careful what you pray for. It's funny, you know, sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll hear people say this. You know, God, I've just, I've been, you know, Pastor, I've been praying that God would use me. God, just use me. And they're all like just enthusiastic, excited until God uses them. <laughs> and then they come back like, what, well, you know, they're all frustrated, upset. I'm like, what's wrong? Yeah, you know, people just been walking all over me. I'm like, well, you did say God used me, right? It's, anyways, well, right, y'all didn't get that. So he comes to sift. He comes to sift. He comes to examine. Come on, you got to do some examining today. Where is your faith? You know, is it just faith to go to church? Is it just faith to sing a song? Is it just faith to carry your title? Or is it a faith that, that understands that the only way that you can develop, see, instead of developing our skill set, how about how about let's not develop only the skill set. How about let's develop our faith muscles because trouble is the only thing that can develop faith. It's the only weight for muscle faith. It's trouble. And you have to understand that. And right now, maybe you're facing a moment in your life, a very difficult moment in your life, or maybe in the next week or two weeks or one year, you're going to face something that's so like it's a crisis or something just so bigger than you and you're, you're not going to know what to do well guess what instead of waiting for something to happen start developing those faith muscles now so when stuff happens you're not falling apart but you know you know how to rise up in that fa in, and face that situation amen and so i love this because um you can't tap into your skill set you can't tap into your abilities when you get into a situation like this with the devil you just can't man you got to tap into your faith you got to tap into almighty god and if you're going to lead Anything great, man, you got to lead with a mind in Christ. You can't lead with small-mindedness. You need the mind of Christ. You need him to lead you, direct you. You need him to help you. You need him to strengthen you in order for you to be that effective leader, in order to be that effective man and that woman of God. You need to make sure that, man, your mind is stayed on God and you watch and see what God will do. The Bible says that many are called, but few are chosen. Have you ever asked yourself, like, why is that verse in the Bible? Many are called, but few are chosen. I could only answer it with this. I wonder how many have given up. I wonder how many have strayed away. I wonder how many have just thrown in the towel. I wonder how many, because he said many have been called, but few, only few are actually chosen. Because only few are willing to just navigate through that. And I get it because sometimes when you're, in that, when you're in that dark place, it's so easy to get all up in your feelings. You know, you can literally wear your feelings on your sleeves. And, and there's nothing wrong with feelings. Please don't misunderstand me. Feelings is something that we all have. But there's, there's, there's a problem when you let your feelings control you and you let your feelings begin to manipulate the decisions that you're making. As a matter of fact, when you're someone that's always operating on your feelings, Here's what happens. The enemy comes and he begins to twist it. 
And, and then you begin to just kind of like bow down to it. And you start, you start being led not by faith. You're being led by how I feel. Like today I feel like singing. I'll sing. Today I feel like staying home. I'm not going to church. Today I feel like forgiving. Today I feel like flipping you off. Today I feel like, you know, whatever it is. But we, we all sometimes, we allow the feelings in our life to literally manage us and control us. So the question is, is how do I start managing and controlling my feelings with it controlling me and keeping me in a place where I feel now stuck where I feel like I can't move forward and uh, I'm setting you up for next week because I have Madeline Carroll next week that's going to be with us we're doing an interview with her she's an actress in Hollywood I've known her since she was like this little and uh, the girl has done so many big Hollywood blockbuster movies next weekend we're going to do one of the movies she did which is I can only imagine and so you don't want to miss it it's going to be a great 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 movie but the reason I'm bringing her is because I know her story you know what, she's, she's been offered like some of the biggest movie titles out there and she just would not compromise her faith. She would not compromise her values. She would not compromise the things that God wanted to do for her. But on the same token, man, there was also this roller coaster of emotions and feelings that she had to learn how to manage through the process because, man, her name could be super huge right now. I mean, she's, she's out there. She's done some great movies, but not at the expense of her, of her character. She just would not do it. And so you don't want to miss it. And um, as I'm watching this, this, this movie, I was thinking, man, there is some truth to this resilience. There's some truth to this. And so I looked up the word resilience. And that word resilience means this. It means resilience is that ineff infallible quality that allows some people to be knocked down by life and come back stronger than ever. I love that. Resilience is that infallible quality that allows some people to be knocked down by life and come back stronger than ever. And let me tell you something. We have to come to a place where we have to position ourselves in a place of strength and not in a place of strain. And I think most often we position ourselves in a place of strain, anxious, worried, stressed out, man, falling apart where God's saying no I want you to position yourself in a place of strength and we have to get our priorities straight in order to do that like for example I know there's times where I, I know when I'm already you know a little weak a little tired you know a little exhausted and it's and it's a clear sign it's when people start annoying me does anyone ever annoy you yeah, anybody start bothering you? Like when you start having signs like, man, these people are annoying me, praise God. You know what I'm saying? That's when you got to check yourself. Like, okay, I need to get my priorities straight right now because, man, I am fainting right now in this area. I don't like you right now. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I love you in Jesus' name, but I don't love you, love you from Mauricio to you. Like I want to stay far away from you. But you know what? That doesn't help. That's, that's feelings that's positioning myself in a place or in a position of strain you're worried you're anxious you're bothered you're moved you're just letting emotions lead you guide you direct you you're falling apart always one moment you're happy the next moment you're not and it's just this inconsistency that just comes and it comes to rob you of your identity it comes to steal your joy it comes to kill the dream on the inside of you that God has for your life and it doesn't help anybody so man we need to stop being stressed and we need to start believing that God is in the midst of any and every single battle that we face. Every battle. Resilience. I love that. Rather than letting your failure overcome you, rather than letting your challenge to literally suck the life out of you, come on, rather than letting emotions exhaust you, because I'm going to know emotions are, they're brutal. They're beautiful, but they're brutal sometimes, right? They will literally begin to just exhaust you. Have you ever just been thinking on something and you thought about that negative thought so much that you're just exhausted? You're ready for a nap. Like, and you didn't even work that day. You were off that day. But, man, you are exhausted from just thinking about every worst-case scenario. You know, or maybe you're in a very tough situation. Man, you're in a pickle at work. Man, someone's been talking about you. Or maybe you made an error. You made a mistake. And now you're afraid, I might lose my job. How am I going to pay the mortgage? How am I going to pay the car payment? How am I going to? And you just start, and nothing ever happened. You just were. You set yourself up in a position of strain instead of in a position in a position of strength think that's why jesus said to peter and when you come back and when you return he says strengthen the brothers in the faith 
That means that right now, maybe you have strayed away with your issues, your problems, your distractions, your hurt, your pain, your stuff. But guess what? Today, you can come back and you can allow God to help you and give you the the faith that you need and the strength that you need to overcome every single obstacle and to realize that God is on your side. God is with you. He is for you. He's not against you. He wants to help you. He wants to lead you. He wants to direct your next step right now. God wants to give you some strategy. God wants to give you the what's next, the how to, but we have to come back to that place of God. Are you getting me this morning? Amen. In a nutshell, when we're talking about, you know, you know, resilience, when we're talking about, you know, rise from the ashes, come back, we're really talking about a bounce back. God wants you to have a bounce back. God wants us to bounce back up. Yeah, you may fall, but you bounce right back up. It's like the palm trees, right? You see all these different huge storms. These palm trees, man, you see them get bent like, shh, the winds stop, whoop. When you, listen, those who are planted in the house of the Lord will flourish in the courts of our God. That's what Psalms 92, 13 says. Those who are rooted, those who are planted, those who are strong in the faith in Jesus, no matter what hits you, he says, man, yeah, you may feel like this right now, feeling, but guess what? When that storm is over, shh, you're right back up. Jesus said, I, I prayed for you, Simon. Just personalize it. I did this morning when I was standing like, I read it, and I, and I read what Jesus said. I have prayed for you, Mauricio. He started with Mauricio, Mauricio. <laughs> Just put your name there. Alexis, Alexis. I have prayed that your faith would not fail you. For, for Satan has come and asked for you to sift you as we, to examine you, to check, to see if you're the real deal. But don't worry. I know you're real. <laughs> God knows you're real. God knows, listen, God knows who is the raw and the real, but God also knows who's the fake. You know, so we can pretend as much as we want around the people that we love, the people that we know, but you can't pretend with God. God knows our heart. God knew that Peter would have a moment of weakness. He knew that Peter would have a moment of defaulting back, of quitting and leaving, but he also knew that people, that Peter had a resilience in him that he would eventually come back. Think about it. He said, I pray that your faith would not fail you. He didn't, Jesus didn't say this. I pray that your ability would not fail you. I prayed that your skill sets will not fail you. I prayed that your bank account would not fail you. No, he said, I have prayed that your faith. He didn't even pray. I have prayed that your sword, Peter, will not fail you. Because how many know that Peter was a, was a chopper? Remember he chopped off that one dude's ear when they came to arrest Jesus? Man, he's just like, cut that dude. He's like, I will cut you. <laughs> that was Peter. Peter had anger issues. Peter was always frustrated. Peter was always cussing. Peter was always doing something that was just out of whack. But guess what? But God still knew the character of Peter, that Peter always had a comeback attitude. And so whether you've, you've kind of faltered back, whether you've defaulted, whether you've kind of been wishy-washy with your Christianity, guess what? You can return. You can come back today and say, you know, I've learned something in this. Just think about that. This stuff is real. Moses was a great example of being led by his feelings. He's, he's leading the children of Israel. He literally brought the children of Israel out of out of Egypt. The people, they saw God's miracles. They've been, they encountered God through Moses. Just think about this, because this relates to all of us. They encountered God. God did miracles, signs, and wonders in Egypt. Then the people were like, yay, God. And, and he gets them out of Egypt. Now they're in the desert. When it was like, you know, in the desert, I just drove back from Death Valley. Man, it was hot. I'm thinking, who in the hell would want to live here? I'm not kidding you. I'm like, it was hot. But I'm thinking, how can someone live through something like this? Now, mind you, back in those days, they don't have the technology and all the stuff we have. So the children of Israel, we're talking about millions of people, were walking through the desert in the heat, but God still showed up and did a miracle. He said that when it was hot in the desert, he gave them a cloud to give them shelter, to give them, you know, shade. When it was cold in the desert, and how many know when, when it gets cold in the desert, it gets cold? He said he would do pillar of fire. So think, God was constantly showing them miracle after miracle, 
blessing them after blessing them, and then they're hungry. He didn't just give them, you know, bread. He gave them carne asada with bread. He was bringing meat. He was showering them with meat from heaven. Why do I share this with you? Because so many of us, you have experienced God. You have encountered God. You, at some point in your life, you said there is a God. But for some reason, it's like the spirit of the Israelites can, gets in us. And we become like that. Even though God was showing up on their behalf, they started complaining. God tells Moses, come up on this mountain, Moses. And, and Moses goes up there. It was a moment where God wanted to give him a refreshing, a new encounter. You know what Moses does? He allows the people to influence his feelings. And all the people follow him up the mountain. And they pitched their tents. And then you know what they started doing? They started walking around the mountain. Walking around the mountain. God never called them to mountain ministry. God called them into a promised land. But isn't it interesting that so many of us, we are so good at expressing and painting the picture of our mountain of problems. I mean, we probably, some of us, we give tours. We're like, here, come check out my mountain. You can show every stump, every boulder, every rock, everything that's on your mountain. Jesus said, don't talk about your mountain. He said, you speak to your mountain. And that mountain will be removed. And how did he say you can move mountains? By faith. And so God is looking at Moses now. He's infected with the Israelites. The Israelites were complaining after complaining after complaining to the point that they started blaming God for their trouble. They said, why did he bring us out? Man, I bet we'd have it even better if we just all went back to Egypt. And I think some of us do that a lot. We default back and say, you know, it used to be better when I used to drink. It used to be better when I was on drugs. It used to be better when I was on pills. It used to be better. I, I didn't have, I didn't feel anything. Well, of course you didn't. The devil numbed you. But God wants to awaken you today. God wants to stir your heart. And so God sees Moses and he says, what you doing, loco? Look at this, Deuteronomy 2, 3. He says this, he says, you have circled this mountain long enough. You've been going around it too long. So he's confronting Moses saying, what is wrong with you? I never called you to this. I called you to a promised land. I called you to overcome. And now you've been overcome by all the people. And now you have been circling the mountain with the people. Think about it. It's that vicious cycle that we all tend to have sometimes. It's that cycle of dysfunction. It's that cycle of complaining. It's that cycle of, 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 of constantly being led by how we feel. It's that cycle of, of losing it. It's that cycle of, of thinking negative, of speaking negative. It's that cycle of unforgiveness. And we just keep walking around the mountain over and over and over again. And you, you expect for God to do something in your life. But God's like, get off the mountain and we can do something. It's time to come back. I never called you from there. Look, he says, you have circled this mountain long enough. Turn around. He's telling Moses, come back. And it's time to go northward. I'll say it this way. He's saying, turn and move forward. Forward. So many of us, we don't move forward. We stay right where we want to live. In the, in the mountain of failure. In the mountain of disappointment. In the mountain of they hurt me. In the mountain of they, they betrayed me. In the mountain of God has forgot, God has not forgotten you. Let, let's stop blaming God. God is with you. God is in you. God is in the front of you. God's in the back of you. God's at the right side of you. God's on the left. God has not left you. You know what happens when we get into battles? That's the time where we actually forget God. But be careful not to become your God in your battle. The battle is the Lord's, not yours. What do we do? We start coming back to ability. We start coming back to skill set. We think we can problem solve it all. You can't. You're talking about a spiritual battle for your life. It's not going to work. Well, I'll just do this and this will fix it. Well, I'll just do that and this will. No, you're just numbing. But guess what? When that wears off, it's still there. Look at your neighbor and say, you have circled this mountain long enough. Same, come back. Say, regresa. 
That means come back. Go back, Odessa. Listen. New challenges in your life is a sign of progress. It's a sign of, when, if you have no challenge, like, listen, I can say at Elevate Church, you know, we're, we're doing pretty good, but we're challenged. I'll never tell you, no, everything's wonderful. Heck to the, no. there's a challenge here every week. And it's mostly people. Because God's in the people business, right? He loves people. But every week there's a challenge, not only in this church, there's a challenge in my personal life, in my family life, in our work. There's a challenge. If you are not being challenged, then you're not growing. But a sure sign of progress is a person who is constantly being challenged by something. God's trying to grow us through some stuff, people. And don't look at it as trouble. Look at it as, a man, this is an opportunity for God to do something amazing. Like, man, if God shows up in this situation right now, he's going to get all the glory in this thing. Amen? Because if, listen, because if you start, if you start relying on your skill set, then the glory goes to you. But if you start putting your faith in Jesus, and you start saying, you know, God, you said you would strengthen my faith, not my pocketbook. You didn't say you would strengthen my hand, my fist, my sword. No, you said you'd strengthen my faith. I'm going to put my trust back in you. It's, a, it's an opportunity for God to do something supernatural, amen? You know who knew that real quick as we leave? Joshua. Joshua was a right-hand man for Moses. What Moses couldn't do, Joshua did. Moses was frustrated. Moses was angry. Moses was infected. And here you have 40 years later, people were walking that desert and died in the desert. Joshua was the only one, uh, along with Caleb, who lived through and they said, oh, heck, heck no, we're getting ours. They even told God, uh, yeah, they're all dead now, God. Can we get ours now? Look at this, Joshua 5.13. It says, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up. Now, Jericho's, Joshua's about to go take down Jericho, but look what he does first. He looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him. The man was holding a sword. He was ready for battle. Look at this. And Joshua went up to him and he asked, are you on our side? Or are you on the side of our enemies? Let me tell you something. This is an encounter that, that Joshua is having with an angel of God. Think. And he's saying, hey, whose side are you on? The guy's like, man, I ain't, we ain't on your side and I'm not on their side. I'm on nobody's side. Do you realize that God is not on your side? God's never going to take your side. God will never agree with your ideas. God will never agree with your ideologies. God will never agree with you. God will not agree with you. God agrees with his word. God is the God of the evil, and he's the God of the good. Why is he the God of the evil? Because you were all, we were all evil at one point, and we all returned, didn't we? Can you imagine if he wasn't the God of both? A lot of us wouldn't be sitting in this church today. We're all jacked up people in need of a savior. And so look, look what he says. He says, hey, <laughs> I'm not... On either their side, he replied, I have come as the commander of the Lord's army. Say the battle is the Lord's. He says, then Joshua fell with his face to the ground. He asked the man, what message does my Lord have for me? And the commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your chanclas. Take your sandals off. Look at this. The place you are standing is what? The place that you're standing is what? So he has an encounter with Almighty God. The encounter, so listen, it wasn't an encounter in a cathedral. It wasn't an encounter in a church with stained, stained glass windows. It wasn't an encounter with God in Beverly Hills or on the most beautiful mountain, you know, site somewhere in the world. No, it was in the desert going to Jericho what what is God trying to say God's saying hey listen when I encounter you or when you encounter me whatever that place is that place becomes holy what is God saying I will teach you the greatest strength nuggets in the battle place and I'll call it holy ground are you hearing me see what you call disgusting ugly I hate this moment God says I'll make it a holy ground take off your shoes and you know what he said man Joshua encountered God so much that he no longer was thinking about the battle 
At that moment, he was thinking about being face to face with God. When was the last time that you got face to face with God? When was the last time that you got in your word and you said, speak to me, God? What word do you have for me today? When was the last time that you sh actually showed up to worship on time? On time, because mo most of you, you just waltz in like at five after, just like, man, just, and then you're just like, it's like, are you serious? I'm mad at you. But I get disappointed. Why? Because I'm thinking, man, it's true what the world says. The world keeps saying this, that the church in America is dying. And we validate it when we show up late. Heck to the No. When was the last time that you worshiped and said, God, speak to me today? When was the last time that you came to church and you, and you weren't grading me on how well he does, but you're actually listening to the word? Or you go on podcasts to just, you know, tickle me, feel good, instead of saying, God, speak to me. When was the last time you opened this book and you said, God, I want this book to be my burning bush. Moses had a burning bush. Your word is my burning bush. Speak to me right now. Speak to me. Do something in me. Challenge me, God. Call me to do something that I am uncomfortable to do. And remember what I said. Be careful what you pray for because God will do it. The place you are standing on is holy ground. So Joshua took them off. I believe that Joshua would advise us today, if he was standing on this pulpit, he would say, before you conquer Jericho, you must first have an encounter with God. Before you start figuring out that whole problem, have an encounter with God. Get before him and say, God, I give up. I suck at this. I don't know how to get me out of this situation. And then after Joshua did that, he got up and he took down Jericho. He overcame the walls of Jericho and he stepped into his promised land hmm. I love that let me end with this I know we went a little bit over who cares because you're on holy ground right now <laughs> what keeps us from being committed what keeps us from, from having strong faith? What is it that keeps us from being strong in the faith of Jesus? I'm going to tell you, it's one simple thread throughout the entire Bible. From the beginning, from Cain and Abel, who could not forgive each other, to the very book of Revelations. Let me explain. Peter is walking with Jesus, they're having a conversation. And the topic of unforgiveness shows up. Peter looks at Jesus and says, hey, uh, Jesus. See, Jesus, Jesus already knew what was in Peter's heart, like I said earlier, right? But he also knew that Peter had some unforgiveness issues because it was Peter who asked the question, uh, Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother? Like seven times? And Jesus like, <laughs> you cute. He, he said, no, seven times 70 times you forgive your brother. What's 70 times seven? 490, okay, four, 409. Who, like, <coughs> forgive someone 409. Are you, are you, here's what Peter responds. He responds to Jesus. He said this. He said, how is this possible? Peter was shocked. He was thinking like, dang, I got to, now I got to forgive that extra person now. I got to, you know, I'm, I'm sure he's, he's like, how is this even possible? Just like so many of us, how is it possible for us to forgive the people that have abandoned us, the people that have betrayed us, the people that have backstabbed us, the people that have talked about us, the people that have slandered us, the people that have lied about us? How can you forgive such crime? Jesus responds to Peter and he says, Peter, he goes right into the next verse of that story. He says, Peter, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, he gives them another analogy. He says, you can tell that mulberry tree, be ye removed, and it will obey you. 
Now, why did Jesus pick a mulberry tree? Well, most trees' root system goes vertical. A mulberry tree goes horizontal. Stay with me. Goes horizontal. Now, for those of you that have, like I have a tree in my backyard that goes horizontal. And it actually, uh, it was ready to start, you know, busting some pipes. You know how it starts? So the, the guy who was working on it chopped off the, the root. The reason that Jesus uses this mulberry tree as an example is when this root system starts growing, it likes to invade anything around it and wrap itself around it, it breaks pipes, it does all kinds of damage. Jesus was telling him, Peter, if you don't forgive, unforgiveness will be like a root in your life. And it's going to come in and it will literally destroy the pipes of your heart to forgive. You will become toxic, you will become broken, you will become dysfunctional, you will become so weak that you will not have life. Now think this, then Jesus is on a cross. He's on a tree trunk, and he is also horizontal. And when his, when his enemies were nailing him to the cross, what did Jesus say? He looked up and he prayed. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So the only thing that's going to hinder your faith in Christ Jesus is a lack of forgiveness. And I know there are people right now, you have not forgiven your parents, you've not forgiven your spouse, you have not forgiven your children, you have not forgiven grandparents, grandparents, you have not forgiven your grandchildren, you have not forgiven your children. There is a thread that happens in our life. If you don't sift your faith and check yourself, you will not come back. Jesus said, I gave you the example of forgiveness. I died for you even when you didn't deserve it. And right now that person doesn't deserve your forgiveness, but it's not about what you're giving. It's about what you're getting. When you forgive, you get healed. Amen. Close your eyes, bow your heads. Father, we thank you. We thank you because you are a God who gives us the faith. You've equipped us with every spiritual gift, Father. Lord, there's no excuse for us not overcoming. There's no excuse for us not releasing people that have harmed us and hurt us. You were the example of forgiveness, but you were also the example of power and authority and dominion. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would do something unique and special in our heart. Father, help us today to release anyone, Father, that has hurt us, hindered us, anyone that has caused damage and harm. Father, I pray that today we would have the power in the name of Jesus to release those people, Father, and to receive the healing that you provide for us today. We thank you, Father, that you who has begun a good work in us, you're gonna finish that work. Today's a brand new day, Father. We're coming back. We're strengthening our faith. We're gonna sift our faith. We're gonna examine it, Father. We're gonna check it. We're going to scrutinize it ourselves and really be honest with ourselves and be brutally honest and say, yes, I do have faith in Christ or my faith has been shattered. Father, I pray that you would refresh every single soul here today. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.